All right. Well, thanks so much, Liz. And thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Can you hear me okay at the back? Okay, great. Um, so it's great to be here with uh, such an excellent audience of professors and students today. I have really enjoyed the interactions I've had so far and look forward to talking with many of you um, as we go through the talk and into the reception this afternoon. So I'm gonna be sharing with you some of my work around climate impacts, climate adaptation and climate resilience planning in marine fisheries. And in the talk today, I'm going to start with the area that most of my work has been focused, which is the Northeast U.S. shelf. So looking at the Northeast U.S. and sharing with you some of the um, conditions that we have been experiencing related to climate change, particularly ocean warming, some of the impacts that we're seeing in our ecosystem and fisheries and how fisheries are being affected by responding, responding to those changes. Then I will move into thinking about and sharing with you some work that we've been doing on climate resilience through this international working group um, that Liz mentioned and um, bringing forward some resilience attributes that we have developed and used in a new assessment tool to support resilience assessments in marine fisheries. And then I'll conclude with a few ways forward for advancing climate readiness and resilience in fisheries. So to start with, we'll, we'll look first at the Northeast shelf of the US. And just to orient you, I've included this map. When we talk about the Northeast shelf, do I have a pointer here? If I use the pointer, here we go. Um, so the Northeast shelf extends from the Gulf of Maine in the north down to Cape Hatteras off of North Carolina. The shallow ledge here is George's Bank and essentially isolates and forms the Gulf of Maine, which is a deeper um, area here, uh, north of Cape Cod to south of uh, south of Nova Scotia, and you'll see the American lobster and its fishery feature prominently as examples in my presentation today. So, along the Northeast Shelf, our ocean temperatures have been warming at exceptionally fast rates. Since we have the satellite temperature record dating back to 1982, over that time period from 1982 through, this goes through 2021, the Northeast Shelf has been warming about two and a half times faster than the global average warming rate. And in the Gulf of Maine, we've been warming about four times faster than the global average rate. So this is an exceptional hotspot of warming when you look at um, the rates of change that we're experiencing in the Northeast Shelf relative to other areas of the world's oceans. Um, and this is shown here in a map where the colors depict where we sit against percentiles of warming rates around the world. I've only clipped out this region and everything essentially is showing up as warming faster than 80% of the world's oceans. And those areas in red are warming faster than about 98% of the world's oceans. So you can see here how the Gulf of Maine really stands out um, within even this region that's warming very rapidly. We've also been experiencing marine heat waves. So our first experience with a marine heat wave occurred in 2012 when we had a heat wave that developed early in the year and persisted through much of the year and spatially extended from the Labrador Sea over to Iceland and down to Cape Hatteras. This area, um, this particular image is from August where you can see temperatures two to three degrees in some areas warmer than the long-term average. So these are the temperature anomalies um, depicted there. And this was sort of a first wake-up call that it was an abrupt temperature event that sparked a series of changes in the ecosystem and our fisheries. And since that time, we have experienced more frequent and long duration heat waves as well. So you see 2012 standing out here. The heat waves are um, detected as days when the temperature exceed the 90th percentile of historical temperatures experienced in that area for a, a reference period that's 1982 through 2011. So you can see that um, the black bar for 2012 extends across much of the year. And the, the deepness of the red indicates how strong the temperature anomaly was on a particular day of the year. So 2012 was really a first 
experienced where a heat wave really stood out in this region, but we've experienced years with substantial heat waves or lasting for several months of the year. Um, subsequently in 2016, 2018, 2021 in particular, and 2022 stand out. Um, and in the Gulf of Maine, in, this is for the Northeast Shelf as a whole, but in just the Gulf of Maine portion of the no Northeast region, 2021, the bar stand, extends across the whole year. Every day of 2021 would have been considered a marine heat wave in the Gulf of Maine region. So heat waves are increasing in frequency um, in the area and becoming much more routine as we measure them against um, our historical baselines. And in addition, the sort of changing um, seasonal cycle is showing up in our temperature record as well. So if we look at when temperatures warm up and when they cool down, we are experiencing temperatures that feel like summer over a larger portion of the year. So since the um, temperature record uh, began in 1982, we've seen temperatures in the Gulf of Maine feel like summer for two days per year longer as we've progressed um, since the start of that time series. In the mid-Atlantic, it's been more uh, around a rate of summer increasing about one day per year over that time series, um, which affects things like when, uh, when phytoplankton bloom, when you really start seeing productivity of the system kick up and how long into the fall temperatures remain warm can influence things like spawning times or out migration times for certain species. And then um, just to kind of bring this all together, when we look at the temperature record uh, in the Northeast Shelf region, oh, wow, that's really pale. Is it really pale for you as well? What? <laughs> Sorry about that. But basically what you see from 1982 through 2010 is variability with um, variability around a mean that is substantially lower than the mean temperature from 2010 onward. So we've experienced more than a degree of Celsius change in the mean temperature and really are living in a different temperature regime in the Northeast Shelf since 2010. So the warming temperatures, heat waves, changing seasonality of warming and cooling all affect fish populations in a variety of ways. Um, across many different species, we're seeing shifts in spatial distribution, phenology of life history events, um, the growth that they experience, and productivity of populations. And this is true for species that are native to the region, like American lobster. Um, we're seeing new species like black sea bass that used to rarely occur in sort of the northern portion of the Northeast Shelf more routinely show up. And we're seeing species at the very edge of their range, like northern shrimp, disappear from um, the Northeast Shelf. And uh, it's affecting species that are at the bottom of the ecosystem and high, higher trophic level predators, as well as protected species and commercial species. So I'm gonna walk through uh, just an overview of some of the changes that we're seeing occur in fish populations and the ecosystem. So spatial distribution changes are occurring across many, many species with many stocks moving poleward and to deeper depths as waters warm. So the deeper depths enables them to also find a different way of escaping or adapting to warming temperatures. This is just one example using silver hake where you can see that silver hake in the late 60s and early 70s was concentrated sort of at the shelf break in the mid Atlantic, but by the 2000s had really moved into the Gulf of Maine. So a substantial shift northward reflected here in the change in the lat latitudinal centroid for that stock. Um, but this isn't a pattern that's common for just silver hake. It really stands out across many different species. We're also seeing mid-Atlantic species move into the Gulf of Maine. So a shift from species that were common in the southern part of the region, moving into the northern mm -hmm. part of the region. Black sea bass is one example I mentioned earlier. Longfin squid are another. They have um, they do show up in the Gulf of Maine historically, and they, they're they familiar in the area, but they have started coming in, staying in our coastal waters during longer portions of the summer. So they're no longer as ephemeral as they used to be. And then every year we get many reports of 
unusual species that are showing up in the area. And this is where citizen science can be really important for highlighting things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a scientific survey or um, you know, unless you have lots of eyes on what's happening in the ecosystem. So to bring this together, I've put here um, a heat map for 30 of the most commonly observed species in our bottom trawl surveys that are conducted by the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And essentially, the darker the red, um, it, the darker red indicates more of a, norther, a northward shift in a particular species. And you see over time, generally movement toward more reds in the right-hand portion of this figure. So species are shifting northward, but when we look at the temperatures they're encountering, they're not necessarily shifting northward fast enough to avoid experiencing warmer temperatures. So they are adapting as conditions change, but not necessarily able to change quickly enough or move far enough to escape the warming that the ecosystem as a whole is experiencing. And this affects growth of um, a variety of different fish species. So with warmer waters, according to the temperature size rule, we expect fish to grow faster when they're younger and smaller um, at, at earlier ages, and then plateau at smaller body sizes later after they mature. So you see this pattern here with American plates where I've isolated um, the decade, the 2000 to 2009 decade versus the 2010 to 2019 decade. And you see that as waters warmed up in the region, we do see this expected growth pattern for American place. They're growing faster when they're younger and plateauing at a smaller body size. But this doesn't hold true for all species. So silver hake is actually showing a contrasting pattern where they have been growing faster in the recent decade and plateauing at a larger body size. And when we look across all of the species that are routinely aged and measured uh, by the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, we see the expected patterns holding for about half of the species that we have routine aging and um, size data for, but not for the other species. And this is where changes in processes really intersect. So the species where we're not seeing um, this pattern hold are those species that have been able to adapt quickly enough to escape the experience of warmer temperatures for the most part. And then the species where we are seeing effects on growth are absorbing the warmer temperatures and it's affecting other biological processes. And then these come together yet again to affect productivity of fish populations. So productivity is influenced by changes in growth and maturity as well as recruitment success, how well um, they survive through early life stages and general mortality that they experience throughout their lives. So we have done work on Gulf of Maine cod and American lobster where we can see temperature effects on population productivity for both of those stocks. And I'm gonna go into deeper depth with American lobster as an example in my talk today. So American lobster is the most valuable single species fishery in the US and has been since 2014. We've been experiencing generally increasing catches in Maine, but declines in catches and major um, substantial decline in fishery in southern New England. And in Maine, we have a very high dependence on this fishery. It accounts for about 85% of the total value of all marine fishery landings in the state. And for many of our small coastal communities from mid coast Maine to down east Maine, it really is incredibly important for those community economies. So we have a contrasting experience, as I've alluded to, with the Gulf of Maine and southern New England lobster populations. In the Gulf of Maine, these are, um, these are data points from the stock assessment that is conducted for American lobster in the Gulf of Maine. We've generally been experiencing a population increase. And in Southern New England, a major decline in the population after the late 1990s and um, hasn't recovered and bounced back even as fishing has declined on that stock. So we used um, this to construct a model that enabled us to ask questions about what might be going on that would explain these contrasting patterns that we're seeing in these two lobster stocks. So we developed a model in which um, temperature 
was used to influence some of the biological processes. So we considered things like growth and maturity, um, predation on lobsters and recruitment success, and brought those together and could then evaluate influence of temperature and other changes on the outcomes for the stock. So when we um, looked at and contrasted the perspectives for the stocks in each region experiencing the actual temperatures that had occurred in those regions versus a stable mean temperature where we had not seen changes, um, particularly increases in temperature over time. What we saw is that under the actual temperatures experienced, the Gulf of Maine lobster population was expected to grow more and to, to um, to result in a higher population abundance than under average temperatures for the region. So essentially warming in the Gulf of Maine gave this population a boost. And um, you can see how the, the model output in blue compares to the stock assessment um, results that we were using to evaluate the performance of the model. In Southern New England, in contrast, had they continued to experience just generally average temperatures in that region, you would have expected the lobster population there to have maintained a higher abundance level. Whereas in reality, under actual temperatures, the population declined. And in fact, our model doesn't even capture the full degree of that decline. But um, there are other things coming into play as well. So what we see when we dig into what's going on behind just the overall influence, we see major changes in recruitment where the high recruitment area really shifts um, from Southern New England and moves up into Cape Cod and the Gulf of Maine. So we've seen a northward shift in recruitment success. We've also seen influences on growth, which affects when the lobsters mature and start contributing to the population, and then changes in predation um, that affect the natural mortality experienced by the stock. Um, and we could ask one additional question with this model, or we could ask many, but we dug into one additional question which is what would happen if we had managed the stocks in different ways? So in the Gulf of Maine, we have had longstanding conservation measures to protect female lobsters and to protect large lobsters. In Southern New England, uh, actually in both areas, we also protect minimum size lobsters. So we wanna make sure they get to the point of being reproductive and contributing to the population before they're harvested. Maine goes a step further and protects the really large lobsters whereas Southern New England doesn't. Uh, have that measure in place. So we flipped these management approaches. And what we saw was that had, um, had a measure been in place in Southern New England to protect the large lobsters, you would have expected, again, a, a bit of a population boost in that region. But by not fishing, the, or if we had been fishing on the large lobsters in the Gulf of Maine, we would have expected the population to come out at lower levels than we actually experienced. So the protections that are in place for the stock, those conservation measures added an additional boost to the population uh, in addition to the warming effect that has occurred in the region. So I think this is really important to highlight just uh, the, the value of thinking about multiple influences simultaneously and to think about climate in the context of other changes that are occurring or other, other factors that we have more control over, which would include our fishery management measures. Um, and then also just to go back to the 2012 marine heat wave, what we saw during the heat wave is that there was a major change in the timing of landings. So landings came online really early during 2012 compared to when they typically come online. And they were also, we were landing incredibly high volumes of lobster in that year. And the US and Canadian systems kind of work such that typically, the Canadian lobster fishery is kind of done for the season before the US fishery kicks into its sort of high landings mode. In 2012, these overlapped. We experienced a really high volume of landings, but the supply chain couldn't absorb that high volume of landings and it actually led to a price collapse. Uh, in red here, you see the price in 2012 dipping to historically low levels whereas the blue would be the sort of average range of prices and the light blue here would be the historical bounds on those prices. So these were really low prices that had never been experienced before. 
And this was a major shock to the fishery system. And we, we did see it spur a variety of actions in the aftermath of the 2012 heat wave. So there were uh, first and foremost, a lot of changes within the industry itself, changes in how um, product was handled. So there was aeration and chilling of water to ensure that they reduced the stress on lobsters as much as possible while they were still out um, harvesting them before they got back to the docks. There were shifts in how the supply chain was prepared to handle the influx of lobsters at different times. So we saw trucking contracts. Our lobsters are mostly processed in Canada, so there wasn't capacity in 2012 to actually move the lobsters to the processing facility. So we now have more flexible trucking contracts in place. And there was an expansion of lobster processing facilities and particularly in Maine, a few came online after the 2012 experience, and also marketing efforts to really create more flexibility in where products could be sold and to open up new markets as needed in conditions um, like this if we experience them in the future. So we have had subsequent marine heat waves, but the effects on the industry have played out very differently. We've also seen um, other adaptation uh, measures come into place within our fisheries. In some cases, fisheries are shifting their locations as species move northward or out of the areas they've traditionally been most abundant. We also see uh, fishers them sh themselves shifting to target different species and diversification of livelihoods as people become really concerned about concentration within certain fisheries thinking about diversifying out into additional fisheries or other livelihood options. One of the, um, one of the diversification strategies we see in Maine is uh, growth in the aquaculture industry and some movement of people from wild harvest fisheries into aquaculture as well. And then finally, a number of community initiatives have taken more um, of a focus on some of the changes that may, they should expect with climate change. So thinking about local seafood as an option for buffering some of the fluctuations in landing, landing volume and value, and then also thinking about shoreside infrastructure and, th and the whole chain from harvest to consumer and measures that could be in place, put in place along the way. So I'm going to shift now from the, um, the Northeast Shelf, Northern New England experience to thinking about climate resilience more broadly. So as I highlighted in sort of the temperature section, we are experiencing really anomalous warming in the Northeast region and feel like we are at the forefront of having to learn lessons and to understand some of these changes as they are occurring but also feeling like there are other regions where we should be learning lessons and trying to, trying to benefit as much as possible from experience, other experiences others have gone through. So I have been leading up a, a global working group on climate resilient fisheries where we can build some of the shared understanding and synthesize some of the experiences that have been playing out in multiple fisheries around the world. And I'm gonna share with you some of the products from this working group today, where we focused in on thinking about resilience in multiple dimensions of fishery systems. What are some attributes in fisheries that can support climate resilience and how might we use those for assessment of resilience in different fisheries? And then conclude with some takeaways in terms of resilience strategies. So this working group was supported by the Science for Nature and People Partnership, which is also a partnership between TNC and Wildlife Conservation Society. And we were able to assemble a group of participants from around the world, really all continents represented except for Antarctica in, at some point and in some way in this working group. And the group um, worked through three key questions. So the first was to think about what are some of the key features of fishery systems that can help make them resilient to effects of climate change? What approaches and tools can confer climate resilience in fishery systems? And then how can we diagnose resilience and identify ways to build and support resilience in marine fisheries? So essentially we work through a multi-stage process with the first step of our work focusing on looking at 
work that has already been done around resilience in social ecological systems broadly to draw from that work, a working definition that we could use of resilience and um, a sense and understanding of principles and attributes of resilience in different social ecological systems. We then use this to structure an analysis that would enable us to identify attributes of resilience in particular fisheries and look at the status of those attributes in case studies from around the world and then put that together into a system level analysis of a particular fishery. And from there, we moved into trying to take what we had learned and improve upon it to think about how we could use that for operationalizing resilience in practice and for providing tools that would support assessments and decision-making related to resilience. So I'm gonna walk through each of these pieces in more depth. Um, starting with our working definition of resilience, which is simply, the capacity of a system to withstand, recover, adapt, or transform in response to change. So a really large spectrum of potential responses that could confer resilience. And we um, focused on multiple dimensions of fishery systems in thinking about resilience, the ecological dimension, socioeconomic, and governance dimensions of fishery systems. Um, we conducted a literature review that ended up focusing on other reviews of resilience attributes in social ecological systems and took the um, insights from those reviews, organized multiple attributes into a heuristic, just basically a simple way of organizing and classifying the many different types of attributes we were seeing into um, five different categories that had been used for thinking about elements of adaptive capacity. So, Assets or stocks really represent resources that can be drawn upon in a system to be able to respond to change. Flexibility represents just a general ability and features that support an ability to switch strategies or make other adjustments as needed. Organization reflects the components, relationships, networks, and institutions in a particular system and how they link to one another. The learning um, element of this really represents the capacities to recognize what might be causing change and to assess different options for responding. And then agency is important as the capacity to act on change or to actually take actions in a certain direction. So through this review, we identified 38 different attributes that could be classified into those domains uh, of resilience in the ecological, socioeconomic, and governance dimensions of fishery systems. I'm not gonna walk through each of these individually, but I want to put them up here so you can see kind of the spread that we had across the different dimensions, as well as the types of domains that were represented um, in each dimension. And we also called attention to the fact that it's really important okay. to consider context in terms of how resilience might um, operate and which attributes might be important in supporting resilience in particular fisheries. And understanding the context entails understanding things like the, um, the history of that system, the power relations that might be at play, and some of the, the ways in which the current structure reflects broader influences on a particular fishery system. So this was published in a paper at the end of 2021, led by Julia Mason, but with contributions from many of the working group members. And it is openly available if you're interested in finding out more. Um, so we next took those attributes and structured a template for using them to evaluate their presence and what they look like and how we might think about them coming into play in different fishery systems. So we pulled together case studies from 18 different fishery systems around the world, with these cases really heavily influenced by the knowledge that was held within the working group. We have systems here that really represent places that individuals in our group know well. This was mostly a desk-based exercise. It was not an active collection of new data in the field, um, although in many cases, the expert who was leading the case study did consult with participants or, or others working on these fisheries in the field. And so it was bringing, you know, 
local knowledge in to cross check and to think about questions that we didn't feel like we had the internal capacity to answer um, completely independently. And so I'm going to share with you today um, the American lobster fishery case study and how we see different resilience attributes showing up in the lobster fishery. So I'm gonna start with you know, one attribute from the ecological system that really supports resilience in the lobster fishery is just the sheer abundance of the population. We have a healthy lobster stock. I just explained how warming enhanced recruitment and growth of that population and how, um, how it has been increasing over time in the Gulf of Maine. And with that increase, it has been able to support high fishery landings. So this has been an important element of resilience in the fishery. It sets the resource base for enabling the fishery to, um, to take advantage of that and turn it into benefits for the social ecological or the social and economic component of the system. So on the socioeconomic side, we see flexibility coming into play through a few different resilience attributes. One is a resilience mindset in the industry. So I mentioned that some of the conservation measures have been in place for decades, um, V-notching of females even back more than a century. And so there has generally been a resilience and conservation mindset in this fishery and the measures that have been adopted have led to uh, magnification of the growth of the population. And these are just a few pictures to show, you know, measuring to make sure lobster is not too small to harvest, a very, um, an egg bearing female with lots of eggs that you can then see the V-notch right here in the tail, and then throwing the lobsters that are too small back over to continue growing. Um, we also see socioeconomic flexibility represented in an attribute related to place attachment. So the lobster fishery in Maine is very local and attached to particular communities and places in the ocean. And this place attachment enhances the conservation ethic as well because people really care about protecting the areas right outside of where they live and where they are routinely working and fishing. It's also reflected in the way we manage the lobster fishery. So there's very local scale management that's structured into management of this fishery at a state level. So the state coastline is divided up into seven lobster zones. Lobstermen are attached to a particular zone and they also manage each zone through zone councils that have industry participants as you know making them up. And so the zone um, structure enables lots of local participation in management of this fishery that then also scales up to a state level. And I'll come back to that in just a minute, which is right here. So the zones are one part of the management structure and the zones have to, they can have quite a bit of um, flexibility in setting certain rules that are specific to the zones, but they all need to generally conform to the requirements of uh, our state management approach. And those uh, are standards set by the main department of marine resources. So there's close relationship here to manage the fishery at a state level. And then also across states in the Northeast, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission plays a role in bringing together different states to manage the resource. So we have other attributes coming out in the organization of the governance system for lobster, which is that it is polycentric and highly participatory, which we identified as attributes that support resilience in the review. And just to go into a few others, I'm not gonna go into these at as great depth, but um, we see a number of other attributes that showed up in our review supporting resilience in the lobster fishery. I touched on the supply chain modifications that were made following the 2012 heat wave. So this reflects flexibility in infrastructure, there's also incredible um, learning capacity and knowledge access in this fishery. We have a lot of data. We have longstanding monitoring programs. We have industry participation in monitoring and in the science processes. And we have stakeholder and scientist collaborations um, that are routinely part of gathering information and using that information for fishery management. Um, and I would highlight that 
some of the attributes that we identified as supporting resilience can also constrain resilience. So there is some concern that the longstanding resilience mindset and conservation ethos in this, in, in this fishery might be eroding over time. And also with climate change, we see portions of the um, participants in the lobster fishery really sort of looking ahead and others very reluctant to sort of think about changes that might be coming in the future. So that influences resilience in different ways and those different components of the fishery. Place attachment can also be challenging, particularly in a fishery where mobility is also limited. It's a small boat fishery. They stay very close to shore. They don't have the capacity to travel very far to track species or to fish in different locations. And the zone structure is also set up to not have that be, uh, there's not flexibility and mobility as a result of that. So place attachment can also be challenging because it's a, there's a strong attachment to place to certain communities and a reluctance to want to move and to travel very far as well. Um, so I will kind of leave that as my summary there and just highlight that when we conducted this case study, we were really thinking about the climate related challenges coming through the ecosystem and affecting the stock of lobster and then the fishery. So we were thinking about things like declines potentially in the future um, of the lobster population in the Gulf of Maine and shifts in location where lobster may become less, um, less prevalent in down east Maine, or sorry, less prevalent in southern Maine, more prevalent in mid coast and down east Maine. And you can't really see those colors at all. Sorry about that. Um, but essentially, we were thinking about these climate related changes coming through the ecosystem. And now, in the past few years, we've had climate related changes arise outside of the fishery system. So I'm sure many of you have heard about the issue with right whales as they shift their migration timing and where they are being found. There are concerns about interactions with a variety of fisheries along the East Coast and the lobster fishery being a huge part of that. Um, and then also the development of offshore wind is a new topic of consideration for fisheries in the Northeast and particularly for lobster fisheries that really blanket our coastal waters in Maine during the fishing season. So we now need to think about resilience of Maine's lobster fishery, not only to a changing climate, but also to a changing ocean, an ocean in which different um, uses will be growing and changes in demands on you know, what we expect to be able to achieve in our oceans will be changing. So the final product from this working group is a planning tool where we integrate this information um, into a six step process to support resilience assessment and planning in fisheries. We just launched this at the end of January. You can play around and look at it and we'd love if you wanted to use it at climateresilientfisheries.net. Um, and essentially we lay out a six step process that goes from specifying the fishery system, goal setting to here in the assessment process, identifying climate impact. So considering many of the impacts that would come into a vulnerability assessment, for example, that have been widely used in fisheries and other, um, other resource arenas, but we've used the attributes that I showed you earlier to integrate those into a resilience assessment component of this process. And then coupling this information, laying out approaches that that can be taken into planning processes in particular fisheries. So there are also other resources incorporated into this website, um, including resources on how to, how to specify the fishery system through system mapping, um, climate impact resources, places you can reach out to if you don't have information on climate projections or information for a particular fishery, some starting points that might be useful there, further descriptions of each resilience attribute, because obviously, need to know a lot more than what I just shared with you if you want to think about what that attribute looks like in a particular fishery. And we fold in details about the case studies that we developed and provide a workbook for working through this process in, um, in a new fishery. So these are the elements of the resilience assessment. We honed the list from 38 to a slightly smaller number, I think 22. So it's not quite so many things to consider and work through. Um, 
And then we also provide some information as starting points. The tool is not designed to be prescriptive, but it is designed to help support some guidance through the different components. So we provide some examples of potential resilience strategies that fit into two bins, really. Strategies that can address particular impacts in fisheries and strategies that could build resilience attributes in fisheries. So one example of a strategy, strategy to address an impact might be if you're experiencing species distribution shifts that are affecting a fishery that you're evaluating or planning for, um, a strategy that might be necessary to help support resilience in that fishery would be thinking about how access rights are available or not available for that fishery or alternative fisheries and the structure that's in place for gaining access to different fisheries. Um, in terms of strategies to build resilience, I'll just highlight that I showed you through the um, American Lobster example, the importance of thinking about size of individuals you're harvesting. So thinking about minimum sizes as well as maximum sizes that are harvested can build in some resilience that can support um, stock growth under declining um, in declining population situations. And so just to kind of bring this together, I want to walk through four fish stocks and ecosystems, socioeconomic dimensions of fishery systems and governance dimensions, some strategies that may be useful in growing to um, support climate resilience. In many of our fish, um, fishery management measures, we do see increasing interest in and attention to climate and ecosystem conditions that influence what we might expect of certain um, populations in terms of their productivity and the harvest that we can take from those stocks. So increasing efforts to consider climate influences in stock assessments or evaluate management strategies that might be more resilient to climate change and thinking about harvest regulations that may buffer some of the impacts for certain um, certain stocks may become increasingly important for enhancing resilience. Also measures that we can take outside of the fishery management process like habitat protection and restoration efforts can be particularly important for certain fishery species like the anadromous fish salmon especially. And then protecting diversity that exists within populations as an inherent way of gaining resilience of populations. So ensuring that we Try to protect that diversity to the extent possible could be important as we look ahead. Um, in the social and economic dimensions, thinking about how we can help build resilience mindsets so that um, we're more used to functioning in uh, situations with high uncertainty and being able to sort of plan for uncertainty and plan for how we can buffer impacts, but not, um, you know, not be reluctant to change and to kind of expect to change as we adapt through those, um, those impacts that might occur in the future. I think it's also really interesting to think about potential um, learning networks and opportunities within the system. And so I think we see already pathways to enhancing fisher to fisher learning and science and industry collaborations that exist in many fisheries, but I think are also growing and taking new forms as we um, as we work through understanding climate impacts. I know in the Northeast and in my experiences working with fishermen, they're often the first to see changes that are occurring. And so being able to have that integrated into the record of changes we should be looking for and ways we might detect those changes in their ongoing progress can be incredibly important. Um, and I would just highlight here the last bullet, which is to think about the fact that as societies take measures to mitigate climate change, we also should expect um, to feel some of the effects of that in fisheries. So this can play out in different ways as societal preferences might increase for lower carbon foods. Many of our fisheries can provide lower carbon food sources than other um, sources available. But also we may start seeing um, a benefit to certain fisheries that can operate with lower carbon emissions. And so thinking about some of the issues that might arise if we do um, impose new mitigation measures and how those intersect with our fisheries could be 
particularly important looking forward. And then finally, in terms of governance, I already highlighted um, some of the issues related to access to species as they shift and flexibility needed for that. Um, but I really wanna focus here on um, you know, the fact that we can develop forward looking information and use that in our management systems and decision making systems, but also that we will not likely have perfect forward looking information, perfect predictions and projections for the future. So we need adaptive approaches that can enable us to manage with uncertainty as well. Um, and then finally, thinking about fisheries and changing oceans raises a need for governance systems that can operate effectively across sectors and not just within fisheries to enable fisheries um, to be integrated into ocean planning and management across many different economic sectors that are active in our oceans. So we will be um, trying to build out the work we've started through this working group as part of an ocean decade program called Fish Score. It stands for Fishery Strategies for Changing Oceans and Resilient Ecosystems by 2030. Within this group, we'll be establishing an international network um, that includes scientists, but also diversifies into other groups of participants as well, including industry participants, fishery managers and practitioners, as well as policymakers. Um, so we are building out this network of people who are interested in climate resilient fisheries that can help support further syntheses and development of information and tools um, tools particularly that could be used for resilience assessment and planning. We'll also be building partnerships in specific fisheries or local to regional partnerships where we can work closely with practitioners in those fisheries to co-develop resilience strategies and try to bring resources from the global network to bear on local application cases and then take the learning from those particular cases back up to the, um, the global network to use those experiences to improve the information and tools we can make available. Um, and then also linking local and global experiences to elevate science and policy priorities to support climate resilient fisheries. So if any of you are interested in learning more, I'd be happy to talk with you more about that. And I just want to conclude with acknowledging that what I've shared with you today is not at all just my work. It's the work that's built around contributions from many different collaborators, key folks who are highlighted here, um, and funding from many different sources. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions, and uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very cool. Um, I, one thing that we really have saw is tools. I've been around too long, but my whole career has been we need to set pros because they work, catch limits, and we need to bring in MPA. Right? All the simulations I've ever done suggest that both of those are completely dumb in the in the in the face of climate change. So if you're fishing moving having an MPA, pretty damn stupid. What are we gonna do? What what's the next generation of tools are we gonna be able to manage fisheries that are themselves not gonna be hamstrung by climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think it that's a great question. I think that it's largely a matter of can we develop approaches, can we develop information and management approaches and governance arrangements that give us that flexibility for fisheries to adjust as their populations do change. And I think we should expect change and we need to design systems that can support fisheries within the context of change. And I think we're starting to see indications of some movement in that direction. The Northeast just, um, we have a state-based allocation approach to the many of our species where different states get different portions of the quota based on historical uh, fishing levels for their particular state. And we just went through a process of redoing those allocations for black sea bass. And what I think is most um, promising about that process is that it set up an expectation that it would be revisited. Uh, it's not a permanent reallocation. I can't remember if it's on three or five year cycle, but that those will be revisited to enable the change that's occurring in the fishery to be reflected in the allocation measures. And so I think systems like that, and then also, you know, tools that can enable us to, um, I think some 
some forward looking predictions and tools that can capture near real time um, situations in fisheries can be effective in certain situations. Um, we had a forecast for when we expect the high landings period of the lobster fishery to really come online. And um, that was a forecasting tool that has no longer, it doesn't seem like you know, the fishery is not being affected in the way it was by the 2012 heat wave. Um, but that's one forecasting example. I think also examples we see in the West Coast of being able to predict where bycatch species and bycatch hotspots might be will be increasingly important, but we can't expect to be able to predict everything. And so being able to also structure systems for um, operating in uncertainty and operating flexibly broadly, I think will be really important. And I think even you know, protected areas and protected seasons won't necessarily become obsolete, but we need to figure out how to design them to be more um, dynamic instead of just static areas on a map or calendar dates when we expect, you know, spawning to happen, for example. So spawning protections may no longer align to calendar dates, but we need to think about how we build flexibility into that. Yeah, yeah really great talk. I guess the question I have about the resilience stuff is um, how resilient something is going to be. It depends on how you define the fish. Mm -hmm. Is it a certain species in a certain location? Mm -hmm. Is it a chunk of the ocean? Mm -hmm. Is it a community that goes out with fishes? And in the last few slides, it seems like those were all kind of mixed up. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. how do you navigate how do you define a fish? Is it a species in a place or is it a fishing community or is it a it, I think it can be different things. So in our case studies, we do have, um, we have some single species fisheries and we have some multi-species fisheries that are more place defined. And so we've at least tested the those situations, but, um, you know, the first step of the process that we lay out is to is to specify your fishery system. And we don't say that it needs to be specified to a uh, particular species or to a place, but you do need to really understand what you are calling your fishery system. And so we haven't really applied this in the context of a community, say, but I think that would be a really interesting. As we move into some of these partnerships, I actually just sent off a proposal where the fishery would be defined based like at a community level. And so we haven't actually put that into practice yet, but we are thinking about what the fishery system is as being flexible. And, you know, I also expect that there will be places where this does not work well and we have to reinvent things or think differently about things. And that's part of what we hope to learn as we put it into practice. I mean, presumably as you aggregate up, you're gonna get more resilience. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, geez, so many hands. <laughs> all right, let's go there and then come back. I saw lots of hands all at once. Yes, you okay. please. Like what does that look like in a resilient like is would that be considered a long like resiliency and is that like a long term thing, a short term thing? How do you just sort of track that? Yeah, I mean we you saw from our resilience definition that it's very broad and can accommodate, you know, both withstanding change as well as well as being able to navigate through many different levels of change. And so um I think the short term and long term piece is really important to think about. And we didn't explicitly kind of tease that apart in the case studies that we did, but some of the cases were built around short term extreme events and others were built around long term change. So there are examples of each in there, but I think, you know, really thinking about how the two come together and interact in any particular fishery is going to be really important. And so, um, you know, one of the ways that I think about this in some of my community adaptation work is pathways to adaptation and timelines for when you actually need to be able to put certain options into place that might not be viable right now. 
how long do you have to figure out how to clear the barriers that will make that option be viable? And so I think that's something that I've used more in the adaptation planning context, but it certainly is relevant and could be folded in here into a resilience planning context because understanding kind of timelines of change um, and planning for those different timelines and really thinking about the many barriers that currently exist and how we can work our way either through them or around them, I think is really important for adaptation and resilience. Okay, Bill, and they, I saw actually her hand last time. So why don't I go to her and then I'll come back. Well, I'm wondering whether as uh, temperature changes in the ocean, whether the uh, ocean currents are changing. Mm -hmm. If they, small fish and lobsters aren't terribly strong swimmers, mm -hmm. so I imagine that they depend to some degree on mm -hmm. currents bringing them places. Yes, that's a great question. Actually, Changes in currents are a huge part of the warming that we're seeing in the Northeast region. So this is larger scale changes in um, the Gulf Stream and Labrador current influence in our region. So those two currents typically interact, they do interact with one another in, um, in ways that jointly influence the temperatures we experience in the Northeast Shelf and Gulf of Maine. And so we're seeing large scale change in the Gulf Stream in particular. And so it's pushing further um, further northward and spreading out. So it's no longer like a jet, it's more like a broad shower spray. So we're getting more of that warm water influence in our coastal waters along the Northeast shelf. So the current change there is part of the story, but also we do see variability in and uh, expect changes in the strength of some of our smaller currents, like the coastal current in Maine being a really important one where you get um, a current that circulates around the Gulf of Maine, essentially coming in from Nova Scotia and then going around the circle of the coastline. And it at times might continue that whole circle if it's really strong, and then at times split off about mid coast and move things out toward the edge of the Gulf of Maine. And so change, we do expect to see changes in that system. I can't tell you the details of exactly how it's expected to change, but it does influence transport, even interannual variability in transport. And so right now we're dealing more with the, the variability and that balancing out from year to year, rather than seeing the effects of that as a directional change. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks for that excellent talk and for bringing me back to the Northeast. Um, I've been thinking about this whole issue of resilience relative to high level governance and what the what the Magnuson Act enables or does not allow and what common fisheries policy to the EU equally enables and does not allow. And both of those um, systems have uh, are not designed for adaptability mm -hmm. pretty mildly. So, so how do we how do we get to the high level policy makers and, and provide the, the kind of encouragement that this change? Because often this very strong political pushback from vested interests. Yes, I think it's a huge challenge that I don't have a perfect answer for, but I do think we're starting to see, I feel like we're, we're hearing loud and clear voices from industries that things are changing and the system is not enabling them to operate effectively within, through those changes. And so I think that is being heard loud and clear. I think we're seeing some of that effect come into, say, the Black Sea Bass um, reallocation approach that I just mentioned. I think we're also seeing it, the Northeast just changed sort of how we do research stock assessments and management stock assessments. So there is now room to bring new influences into stock assessments without waiting five years for the next research track assessment. So I think that we are in some ways building in the capacity to take in more information and to incrementally adjust to change. But I think figuring out how we elevate that to a policy level, not just enable these things to happen within policies, but to make it more of a policy priority without sacrificing the conservation gains that have been made by restricting some of that flexibility is a huge challenge. And I don't have an answer to that, but um, I'd love to, talk with you further and think about ideas on that further. And I'm sure there are people out there who work more in the policy realm who maybe have different ideas. So 
but yeah, I hope we can operate within what we have a bit better for now. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm uh, thinking about the zoning uh, provisions within the corporate planning um, fishery. How does that stand up long term when you're when you're talking about these types of forward migrations of these different stocks, mm -hmm. specifically the lobster and the forward migration of more mid Atlantic species? So the zones are only used for managing lobster fishery, so they don't apply to other species. But it is certainly um, a big question about what will happen as we see changes occur in spatial distributions of lobsters. So we are expecting, um, and we're, we're already seeing some signs of declines in lobster in the Southern part of the state and um, you know continued growth in the lobster population further down East in the state. So this is in creating you know, different types of challenges that are no longer consistent across the state's waters and will need to be um, integrated into that next level of coordination with state approaches in different ways. And I think that right now people are very tied to fishing within their zone. And the conservation success of managing that fishery is that you know who's fishing where. And so um, that's a big challenge. And we do see, you know, the, I guess the, counterpoint to lobsters declining first in the southern part of the state is that the southern part of the state will be the first to see new species sort of taking root there and moving into those waters. But in many cases, you know, we don't necessarily have the coordination across different fisheries in how we manage different fisheries to necessarily enable them to all adjust at the same time and to think about how we might open up access and also think about the measures that need to be put in place to make sure we aren't fishing on newly arriving species too soon. We want them to actually be viable long term. So I think this is, you know, a place that gets back to some of the flexibility issues that we haven't figured out how to address fully yet. You want me to take one more? Take one. All right, I see two hands. So. Um, I'll go with the person in the center. I think I've seen a hand in the center for a while. I'm not sure it's been the same hand. And you've shown that they do support larger populations. So I was wondering why you think that the southern New England fisheries haven't established these limits. Yeah, I think it um, it's sort of generally practiced in fisheries that protecting small individuals and enabling you know them to get to the point of spawning is a sufficient management approach. And so there has been a minimum size in place in Southern New England, but I don't think that um, I, the crash of that population just happened so fast. I don't think there was, you know, a lot of time in there to really think about maybe we need more than this and maybe we should be putting in place some of these protections for larger individuals. And so it's also just, you know, whether you had tried to put that measure in place in the 80s or 90s, even in Maine, I don't know if it would have been successful. It's just such a longstanding and accepted measure that it had gained that acceptance. Um, and so I think that, you know, there was an expectation that, you know, we should be, maybe we're doing enough because the population was at high levels for a while and then maybe not enough time to put new measures in place, but they have proposed this and it still got met with substantial pushback in Southern New England. And I think at that point, just a feeling that, you know, things have already crashed so much, we're not likely to be able to generate substantial recovery. And so thinking about the trade-offs there between enabling the fishery that still exists to continue operating versus putting in place measures that might gain an incremental benefit, but maybe not um, be viewed as a substantial enough benefit uh, as part of that conversation too. All right, if you didn't get your question answered, we can track down outside, but uh, let's thank everyone one more time. Thank you.